The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, welcome to For Youth by Youth, a webinar series presented by National Center on Philanthropy and Youth Philanthropy Connect. We are excited to provide the first webinar series opportunity for youth by youth. YPC is a new and exciting way for youth engaged in philanthropy to connect and learn through a peer network. NCFP is the only national nonprofit dedicated exclusively to families who give and those who work for them. Next slide, please. On your screen, you'll see a control panel. You can minimize the panel and ask questions there. Please see the questions box and you can submit questions throughout the webinar when you think of them. So you can reply in the questions and answer period. Next slide, please. So now I would like to introduce to you our presenters who you will see throughout the presentation. Um, Christine from Alliance for Justice, Danielle from Michigan Community Foundation's Youth Project, also called McFIP, Jared, also from McFIP, Jillian from Building Leaders and Innovative New Giving, called Bling, and my name is Ashley, and I'm from Youth Funding Youth Ideas. Next slide, please. Just a quick intro for Ashley. Ashley started working as a program officer at the age of 16 for a youth-led social justice philanthropy program called Youth Funding Youth Ideas, based in San Francisco. Ashley is passionate about gender equality, taking care of animals, and social change. Her favorite grant is One Breath, which focuses on improving the lives of low-income youth by using Dragon Boat as a form of violence prevention. And Danielle started working with philanthropy her freshman year of high school through her hometown's Youth Alliance Committee. And she found that she had a passion for youth philanthropy after attending her first McFib Youth Grant Making Conference. Um, she is very passionate about women's rights and education policy, and her favorite grant was Michigan Statewide College Positive Communities. Next slide, please. So we'll be live tweeting throughout the webinar, and we would love to see you all on Twitter as well as you're keeping up with the things that are being said. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little intro on YPC, um, YPC's mission is to have fun and exciting ways for youth engaged in philanthropy to connect. Um, they also would like to create resources for youth engaged in philanthropy, and they love to connect people and share resources. Next slide, please. Youth Philanthropy Connect was started when the youth at the Lumpkin Family Foundation out of Mattoon, Illinois, started engaging with the foundation at age five in grant making at age 10. And they asked about reaching out and meeting other young people who were engaged in this work. Next slide, please. The Lumpkin, Lumpkin Foundation reached out to the Frida C. Fox Foundation, which is based out of Los Angeles, who begins evolving the youth of, eight, of, of their family at age eight in the junior board that does grant making. Next slide, please. In the summer of 2010, the youth of both foundations met and shared their roles of grant making with each other. And this is where the magic all started. The youth learned from each other's models and it gave them some great ideas for how to develop a large scale opportunity, which we then developed and implemented. So after the meeting, the youth of the Fox Family Foundation went back to their board and asked if they could meet with other groups of youth who were involved in grant making. Next slide, please. This led to the 2011 Youth on Board Retreat, where four family foundations brought together the youth of their family to connect with and learn from each other. And so coming together with these other youth was so inspirational and important to the youth and the other um, attendees um, that it led to youth wanting to create an opportunity to connect and learn together over time. So then this network is now called the Youth Philanthropy Connect. Next slide, please. 
Over the past three years, we've hosted growing annual gatherings of youth philanthropists from families, community foundations, and school-based programs where the youth get to meet with one another and learn together. I've been involved with serving on the leadership team because of what youth philanthropy has done for me. And this has motivated me to stay involved and want to continue my own philanthropic work while having fun and hanging out with others who care about the same things that I do. YPC wants to connect with youth and provide resources in addition to the four. We're also hosting five regional gatherings across the country this summer, and we would love to see you all there. Next slide, please. I would now like to introduce Christine from Alliance from Justice, who will give us guide through the presentation with our youth philanthropy leaders. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Reese Trigero, and that's me on the screen. Um, and I first want to start off by thanking the National Center for Family Philanthropy, and in particular, Angie on their staff, who's been phenomenal, and also thanking um, Youth Philanthropy Connect. Uh, Catherine Scott, who you all know, and as well as Annie Hernandez, are quite a team putting together such wonderful content. And I also wanted to thank each of you and any of your family members who are on this webinar tonight. Um, being a youth who's thinking about philanthropy is an incredibly laudable thing. There's a lot of ways you could spend your time tonight in your choosing to do this and learn about ways that you can help improve your community or your world. So I think that that's really exciting, and I wish I could see you all in person. Um, I will be at the Williamsburg convening of um, the National Center for Family Philanthropy with the Southeastern Council on Foundation and Philanthropy Southwest. So if you're planning on attending that, I look forward to seeing you there. But I wanted to just briefly start tonight. Um, I really liked how two of the youth leaders shared their story. So just let you know a little bit about myself, and then we're hoping to have a really fun, really interactive hour together. So to start off, I work for the Alliance for Justice based in Washington, D.C., and I've been in D.C. for about five and a half years now. I also serve on the national board of a group called Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy. So it's for uh, staff or board members that are emerging or new to philanthropy, regardless of age, but most people are 40 years old and under. We have 13 chapters across the country, and we have a national conference this May in New Orleans. Um, that's still open for registration, but we're uh, really trying to do something similar to what Youth Philanthropy Connect does, of just engaging people who are new and curious and excited about philanthropy with lots of content and still building work as well as networking. So I grew up not in Washington, D.C., but in Oak Ridge Hills, Florida, and uh, during that time, I was a really shy kid. <laughs> I was painfully shy. Um, I wouldn't ask a waiter for anything, let alone give my order. And my mom was a public school teacher for 35 years, and she taught everything from um, emotionally handicapped children to um, gifted children, elementary school, middle school, ended up teaching the arts. And when I was in fifth grade, she taught fifth grade and had a student who invited me to a drama class, and I was never shy again. And I loved theater, and it's amazing how certain things you do can help you later on in life. But I knew theater wasn't what I would do for a living. All I knew for sure when I was um, middle school, high school, college, was I didn't want a job where I was itching for 5 o'clock p.m. every day to go home or just planning my next vacation, but not enjoying what I do. Um, and so much of our work is more than our time with our family. And when I was in high school, I was very involved in student government and leadership work, and we did a volunteer project at a migrant farm worker camp. And Oak Ridge Hills, Florida has a lot of affluence and a lot of middle class, but a lot of poverty too. And that poverty is pretty silent compared to the other groups. And I remember going to this migrant farm worker camp and seeing what was around me. And it was frightening and uncomfortable. And I would look in one place and think how wrong this is, and another place how wrong that is. And here I was, a, a white person, middle class, seeing all of this not having a vocabulary for it, but I got to go home to my own bed and without worrying where my next meal would come from. And it wasn't until college when I took some environmental policy courses and learned a vocabulary about social justice, about rights, about human rights, um, about equity, that I really began to think about a career. And then in grad school, I um, had three professors who used to run foundations or philanthropic institutions. 
some time. And although I went there wanting to be C.J. Craig from The West Wing, if any of you are familiar with that show, um, might be a little before your time, uh, I wanted to work in the federal government, but I wasn't sure if I wanted a job where there were 80 other people who had the same exact job title as me in this department. So these three professors talked to me about what a laboratory philanthropy could be, how exciting it could be, how 911 was a project of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. How there's such thrilling work that's happening where you can be creative. And that's how I eventually ended up at the Alliance for Justice. So Alliance for Justice, um, again, based in Washington, D.C., and we have two programs. One is our Access to Justice program, which talks about access to the courts and helps everyday Americans understand the judicial branch of our government and be protected by it. And our other branch is called Boulder Advocacy, and I work there. And we focus on um, three main things that help foundations. One, we have a team of attorneys who really show foundations as well as nonprofits what the rules are in terms of funding and supporting advocacy and lobbying work. We have another colleague who works on evaluation and planning so that foundations that are interested in advocacy, philanthropy, know how to conceptualize it, talk about it, measure it, um, see the returns on investment for it. Um, and then we have me. So just to kind of sum that up, we, Alliance for Justice is really working on giving people confidence about the kind of philanthropy they can do and how to be advocates or champions for the nonprofit that they support. Again, through our legal team, which talks about the rules and the legal rights of foundations to advocate in addition to giving direct service. Our evaluation program, which talks about how foundations can think about measuring, evaluating, and planning their philanthropic advocacy work. And me trying to think about more ideas of how foundations can engage. How can foundations explore the question of how can philanthropy advocacy be champion? What does that look like? And that leads us to a good question. What is philanthropy? And I'm sure that if I asked everyone on this webinar, or anyone that you know, we would get a different definition each time. But there's a lot to think about. There's time, there's talent, there's treasure, there's philanthropy, looking at the root word of um, brotherly love or Philadelphia as another root. Um, they're thinking of it on the micro level, of just how we give in our everyday lives, on the macro level, how we get through institutions. There's the choice of philanthropy in the form of charity, of arguably have, giving to have not, based on what have predetermined as a problem and a way to solve that problem. And we have philanthropy as more advocacy approach, which is something that Alliance for Justice encourages, where we really like the idea of philanthropic advocacy strategies that allow those who are most affected by the problems in society, not just to be recipients of charity, but to truly be decision makers within philanthropy. So um, just as a quick example, if your foundation is really interested in hunger relief, you could have a more um, charitable route, which is wonderful, um, at a food bank. I've worked at food banks before that are critical backbones to a lot of philanthropy and help countless people. But in addition to funding a food bank, you might also think about why are people hungry? What might they need? What time of day might be best? Or the food bank to really thrive. If you have a successful food bank, how might you advocate to local leaders or state leaders or national leaders to use your food bank model on a grander scale? How would you think about food stamp policy? How would you think about job creation so that less people would need the resources of a food bank? So those are some examples of how advocacy comes into play. And it's, um, there's a favorite quote of mine by Archbishop Camara from Brazil who said, when I give people food, I'm called a saint. But when I ask why people are hungry, I'm called a communist. And sometimes in philanthropy, uh, we don't like to be called certain words. And as humans, we don't like that either. But if we really think about how we can best serve and empower those who are most marginalized, that's the kind of philanthropy that I really enjoy. And as you go in your journey, I hope you think about that too. So moving on, 
Oh, sorry. So moving on, you're about to talk about uh, the art versus the science of philanthropy. So let's start with the science. Does anyone guess what this is? Has anyone been through 11th grade chemistry class? I still have horrible memories of it. <laughs> but um, this is actually the periodic table of elements which you might recall. And it's pretty important to science. It's pretty important to our lives. Um, in particular, we have hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, which is pretty critical. And I was recently looking at this, and it got me thinking about philanthropy, believe it or not. And I was thinking, how can we think about philanthropy in terms of basic core elements? If hydrogen and oxygen are critical for our natural world, what's critical for our philanthropic arena? What are building blocks of philanthropy scientifically? So just work with me for a minute. Let's consider the philanthropic table of elements, or GRIPS for short. So instead of, um, uh, instead of hydrogen, we'll have grant advocacy, so, um, or grant philanthropy in general, but thinking of grant advocacy as a form of philanthropy. So, Grants are incredibly important. Um, they're the main thing that we think of when we think of a foundation. Um, they're hopefully a symbiotic relationship between the grant maker and the grant speaker. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But there's also things to consider. If you give a $10,000 grant, how much of that money is net versus gross grant, like net for gross income? If a foundation has a nonprofit fill out 10 hours worth of work of application process, or have site visits, how much time is taken away from that grant? Would a $10,000 grant at the end of the day, after all the time and the hourly wages of the people working on that, end up being only a $7,000 grant? So that's something to think about. Another key element to think about for grants as a form of philanthropic uh, building blocks is, um, I'm sorry, is that of a foundation's work, only 5% of the foundation's assets comes in the form of risk. The rest is invested in the stock market so that it can exist in perpetuity if it's an endowed foundation. So now let's move on to reputation. How might a foundation use its reputation to advance its philanthropic mission, whether it's working on health, education, worker rights, the environment, art? Why is reputation important to us? For a foundation. Well, first of all, foundations are often pillars in the community. It's hard to find a bad foundation. Foundation board members and staff members are often well connected to make introductions for their grantees and write off eds and papers to further their causes and have speaking engagements where they can champion issues publicly. So, again, just thinking about that external force of a foundation reputation that can be really important. Third, we have um, investment. So earlier I was talking about grants, which make up 5%. So if you do the math, the remaining 95% of a foundation's worth financially is invested in the stock market. So if a foundation was worth, let's say, $100, they would give away a $5 grant and invest 95% to the stock market company so that it can exist for the foreseeable future and beyond. Now, there is a great opportunity here. So let's imagine your foundation is interested in the environment. So you use your 5% to invest in the Sierra Club or other environmental causes. But what would happen if you invested your 95% in the stock market and you were investing in oil or coal companies that the Sierra Club, your grantee, is actually trying to come back? Is that a good use of your investment dollars? Should your mission cover both your investment dollars and your grant making dollars? Or should you even know simply what companies your foundation is owning the same way you know what grantees your, your 
access? Do you remember what the investment percentage is? Any math majors that can subtract? <laughs> 95%. Then we have reputation, which is how your foundation is viewed outside your reputational capital. You have your personnel inside capital. And then finally, you have your sector capital, which can or sector advocacy, where you can work across the philanthropic sector as well as across all sectors. So these are just five examples of the different philanthropic elements that can make up philanthropy. So think about what your strength philanthropy is, what your grip, if you will, is on each of these. What might be your strength element for your philanthropy? where you spend the most time and are most successful, and what might be an area of growth. So next, we have art. And these are really nice cover images. So when we think of science, we think of the tactile, we think of things we can measure, we think of a periodic table of elements. But what about art? This is a rather famous painting of the Mona Lisa. Shakespeare's plays are certainly art forms. Yo-Yo Ma playing the cello is maybe my favorite musician. So what do we think about if we translate philanthropy into art? Well, here's three things I came up with. There's an art of helping our grantee partners and treating them as true partners and not contractors who are helping a foundation achieve their mission. It might be helpful to think about how many nonprofits have a foundation mission statement memorized. But how many foundations have a nonprofit mission statement in that? Another example is how we're able to build relationships with our grantee partners. What would it look like if a grantee had a problem and their first instinct was to call up their foundation program officer to get ideas without worrying if that foundation program officer would think of them differently or if their funding would be in jeopardy, but just saw them truly as a resource and a friend? And then most importantly, thinking about listening. When foundations come into a room, there's a lot of power. There's funding there. There's wealth there. There's opportunities there. Um, but how can a foundation lead by listening, by asking good questions, by making sure people feel heard and valued? So I wonder if you have any to add to this in terms of what are those intangibles, those things that can't quite be measured but that are critical to philanthropy? Without helping foundations, without helping grantees, building relationships with them and listening to them, that whole periodic table of elements might be weak. So with the remaining time, we are going to do four fun exercises. So you're not literally going to exercise, but we're going to do some thought exercises that will help stretch our minds a bit and apply what we're thinking about in terms of art and science. So what I'm going to ask you to do is you're going to vote four times. I'm going to share an exercise, and then I'm going to ask you whether you think it's an example of philanthropy as an art or philanthropy as a science. And then I'm going to ask one of our great four youth leaders to share what the results were, how they voted, and any reflection they might have in a few seconds. Let's get started. So number one, now remember, you get to vote if this is an art or a science. So here are three numbers, 3 billion, 51 billion, and 70 billion. Do those numbers ring a bell at all? What if I told you it was $3 billion, $51 billion, and $70 billion? Well, let me tell you what they stand for. So $3 billion is how much the Gates Foundation gets away each year. $51 billion is how much all foundations in the United States give away each year. But $70 billion is the state of California's education budget alone for um, state and federal dollars. So it really shows that although the Gates Foundation is head and shoulders the largest foundation in the country, giving away $3 billion every year, that your foundation probably has more in common with the Gates Foundation than the Gates Foundation does with one state's education budget. And this can really show that, again, no foundation has enough money to solve all the problems that need solving. So how do we leverage those dollars? How do we make them go further? And how do we create more equity? Just to think about this. 
So, if everyone can take a moment to vote, and then we are going to hear how the results were by Jared, one of our youth leaders, and see how he voted. So is that an example of philanthropy as an art, or philanthropy as a science in your mind? And here's a little hint, there's no wrong answer. So we'll wrap up this poll. And then, uh, Jared, when you're ready to announce the results and um, how you voted and any reflections. Um, all right, so looking at the results right here, it turns out that 14% of you voted that the first exercise was an example of art as a philanthropy, um, and 86% voted as science. That's pretty much in line with what I would have said. Um, I would have agreed that it's probably an example of science. I know that from personal experience, people really aren't that aware of philanthropy. Um, in a broad terms, I remember having talked about it as if uh, I was mentioning to a couple classmates about um, the possibilities for pursuing a career or a life goal in philanthropy, and people simply weren't aware of it. And this definitely demonstrates that uh, understanding because looking at it, the education budget for a state is much larger than all of the amount of money that's granted out out of all of our sectors. And so I think that from that perspective, yes, it's a science that we need to explore different avenues for expanding our philanthropic efforts and definitely considering the economic impact and making the most out of every dollar that we can grant out. That's great. So if any of you have any comments or questions about the you're done. 
how would you design it? Would there be anybody living by a dump or a super fun site? Would there be anybody who doesn't have a good job or health care or a good education access to it? How much funding might the foster care system get? Because remember, you might be in foster care if you are plucked into that role. So you would probably design a pretty equitable society. You would probably design a society where maybe philanthropy wasn't even necessary. We put ourselves out of business because it would be in your best interest. It would be in everyone's best interest because everyone wants to have great opportunities in front of them. Now, let's use a philanthropic application of this. John Rawls, let me repeat, did not, did not come up with this. So please don't attribute this to him. Um, now, imagine you get a phone call one day. This is my personal dream phone call. Imagine you get a phone call. Someone calls you up and says, Christine, I have $5 billion. Can you help me create a foundation and give it away to worthy causes that serve and empower people who need it most? How exciting would that be? You get to design everything. You get to pick where the foundation would be located, what issues you'd focus on, what places you would focus on, um, how to get the community members involved, who you would hire, everything. I mean, how thrilling would that be to have that? There's just one catch. The person on the phone lets you design everything, but they don't tell you your role at that foundation until it's done. So you don't know if you're going to be the board chair, the CEO, a program officer, a secretary, or maybe a nonprofit leader who's applying for a grant. If you knew all of that, how accessible would you make your foundation? What issues would you focus on? How long would the grant application be? What would site visits look like? Would you do mission investing? And make sure your endowment aligns with your mission statement just like your grants do. How might you champion your grantee partners with your personnel internally and your reputation externally? Would you work across sectors or within the philanthropic sector? Again, not knowing if you're a board chair and CEO or if you're someone applying for a grant from the community. So let's take a moment and think about whether that example was art or science, and then we are going to have Danielle share the results of her thoughts. And again, if you have a comment or a question um, that we can get to at the end, please type it into the box. Well, it looks like the votes are in and 86% of you said that this was an art and 14% of you said this was a science. Um, doesn't really surprise me. I think that this is probably the way that I would have gone as well. Um, I think that this question um, differs from person to person um, and how important that they think they are in imagining the situation. So some might say that they would divide everything equally and make everything very equitable because they think that that's what's best for themselves or they might um, divide everything equally because that's what's best for everyone else or some might um, not even put everyone on the same level at all. I think this aspect of philanthropy is definitely um, like not down to a science. It's definitely open for interpretation, more like an art form. And I think that um, in doing this exercise, uh, I realized that every voice being heard is important, whether I know what I am, uh, what position I'm in or not. Thank you so much, Danielle. And that was actually a perfect way to end our
third exercise will show that as well. And another thing to just think about as we lead into the third exercise is a quote by Mary Jones. And she was um, a labor organizer that fought for labor rights. Um, something that the um, Ford Foundation now needs a lot. Um, but uh, she had said, my job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And in this next activity, we're going to afflict ourselves with some pretty uncomfortable questions. But I think that that's important and it makes us grow and it makes us thinkable and it stretches us. And I believe that that's inherently a good thing. And I definitely include myself among the comfortable Half the world doesn't live on more than two dollars a day, so we all have a degree of comfortable. So I think that quote um, really captures a lot of what philanthropy could be. All right, so now for our third activity exercise. Again, remember to please vote art or science. So here we go. Let's start with some levity. This was an image that came up when I looked up the phrase power dynamics. So a golden retriever puppy on the bottom isn't enjoying him or herself too much as the golden retriever puppy on the top. Now you're going to ask why this has anything to do with philanthropy unless you're involved in funding the Humane Society. But I think this actually sums up a lot of the philanthropy that I work on and work on with foundations. And that's the power dynamic between foundations and their nonprofit grants. Now, ideally, um, this would be a symbiotic relationship, right? You have one group that has funding and is able to give it away, and another group which is able to use funding for important projects. And unless foundations start doing all of their work in-house, where their program officers also do the work on the ground, they need nonprofits just as much as nonprofits need them. But yet, it seems as though funding, there's more of a demand for it economically or using funding for programs and strategies. So let's think about this a different way. I want you to have another thought exercise moment and think about these two numbers. In the United States right now, according to USA Giving and the Foundation Center, there's roughly 1.5 million U.S.-based nonprofits, while there's roughly 86,000 U.S.-based foundations, most of which have no staff. Um, now look at these two numbers. Of these two groups, nonprofits, grantee recipients, foundations, grant makers, among other things, grant makers is just one of the activities they do. Which group do you think has the most power? Which group do you think has more influence? And power and influence are not bad things. Sometimes we cringe a little bit when we hear them, but they're important. Power gives voice. Power is something that um, countries are built on, nonprofits succeed on, um, can be used for good or bad. So don't inherently think it's a bad thing. Well, I hope we would both realize, all realize, that foundations in our society right now have more power. And if you disagree with me, let's try this. What would happen if these numbers switched? What if suddenly there was 1.5 million foundations and only 86,000 nonprofits, all things being equal, okay? What would that mean for our sector of philanthropy and nonprofits collaborating? Would this mean that nonprofits would send out requests for proposals for foundations to fill out instead of the other way around? Because foundations want to get their money out the door, at least 5% um, a year, or they'll be in trouble with the IRS. So would that mean foundations would try to make their funding as competitive as possible to nonprofits, giving multiple years of support at one time, where right now 89% of the 1,100 largest foundations in the country give no multiple year support, meaning nonprofits have to review, renew every year? Um, would it mean that there would be nonprofit-only events, the way right now there's sometimes philanthropy-only events? Would foundations all do mission investing to make sure that their endowments were aligned with their mission, or maybe nonprofits wouldn't want their funding. Would nonprofits do site visits of foundation offices to see how foundations are spending their overhead money? Would they question it all 
how nice the foundation office might be, or what view they might have, or how much they're spending on staff salary. Um, what else might happen? Would development directors be the most sought after job in the nonprofit world as opposed to program officers and foundations? So when we think about all of this and we couple it with that veil of ignorance thought exercise, it seems as though it's the onus on the foundation side, those that have the power in our real society right now, to perhaps bring up these conversations, which can allow for more open and transparent conversations. But it's really more up to the foundation to bring it up because it might seem self serving if a nonprofit brings up power dynamics. Um, and why bring it up at all? Well, again, what happens if there is a problem or an opportunity? A foundation and a nonprofit that have more equal ground, that are looking after each other, that are servant leaders, might be able to solve those problems better and capitalize on opportunities better, too. Plus, it allows for just a better dynamic. And a lot of times, there's a revolving door between staff and foundations and nonprofits over the course of a person's career. They might work in both. So, given this little exercise around power dynamics, do you think this is an example of philanthropy as an art or philanthropy as a science? And then we're going to hear from Jillian, who is a fan of discussing car dynamics as well as golden retriever puppies. Okay, so it's the results show that 83% of you guys voted for art, while 17% of you guys voted for science. Um, well, when I was thinking about this question, I was sort of torn between whether or not it was art or science, um, especially since one of the first things I was thinking about linking of all the questions that Christine was asking was um, mutually beneficial relationships in, like, biology that you learned about in like ninth grade about two species that benefit from each other and so I was leaning towards science and that bit and so I think it's really interesting when people raise these kinds of questions about what happens if you shift these power dynamics if you give the person who is generally doesn't have as much power the all the power that the person above them does how that changes how their relationship works how one group would talk to and interact with another, and how would they perform towards each other? Like, would foundations really make their grant cycle, their application cycles so competitive? Would nonprofits work as hard as they do currently to receive the money if there is more foundations that they could receive money from than the smaller amount that they have now? So I think it's really interesting and it's a huge kind of discussion and topic that could really be discussed in a webinar of its own. So, yeah. Definitely. And again, I think it's also realizing, although I was showing two sides there, we're all on the same side, right? We're all four people um, being literate and well-fed and educated and healthy and safe. So um, there really is just one side. And whether you work in philanthropy for a foundation or work in the nonprofit space for a nonprofit, if you're dedicating your life to one of these causes, your level of motivation is really high. So how can foundations and nonprofits through servant leadership really support each other um, in a symbiotic way so that we can all achieve more? And I think that if we had that solved, um, that would be pretty exciting. And maybe that's what your generation is going to do. All right. So, we now have one final um, exercise before we have probably about 10 minutes for questions. So, please be thinking of your questions and type them into the box there. So, this is going to be a little bit different than the first three. Instead of voting between art or science, I'm going to ask you to vote for one of three people. So, this is my favorite exercise that I do. 
So what I'm going to ask you to do is imagine that you're the president of a foundation. Imagine it's the day before your, your fiscal year ends, and you have one $50,000 grant to give. And you can only give one, and that's the smallest increment you can give. And you have to decide between three executive directors to give it to. And your program officers have been doing some research about those three people, because so often philanthropy is about relationships, not just an exchange of funds between institutions. So I want to tell you a little bit about each of these three executive directors, and then I'm going to ask you to vote on whether you think you should give funding to executive director A, B, or C. So that's what you'll be voting for. So let's get started. Which executive director would you select? So executive director A is on a mission to end human trafficking, to end the exploitation of people. And here's a little bit of information about her. In addition to wanting to end human trafficking in her developing country and setting up safe houses for her victims, she has a little bit of a sort of path. According to the research that your program officers have collected, she herself is a victim of human trafficking and domestic violence. She's endured so much violence, in fact, that it's believed by rumor that she took a blow to the head, which made her mentally disabled. She is wanted by the law, and yet she has not yet been caught or convicted. She is illiterate. She is described as paranoid, and she never stays in one place or one job for very long. And the only job she's ever held is in domestic service. What would you think of funding Executive Director A? Now let's take a moment to look at Executive Director B. She wants to create international health care policy and form a school for nurses. She's recently emigrated to the United, immigrated to the United States, and she's described by friends, enemies, and acquaintances as a radical and incredibly controversial woman. She has no experience as a leader of an organization or a fundraiser. What do we think of this radical immigrant inexperienced executive director who wants international health care policy and a school for nursing? And finally, we have Executive Director C, who wants to amend her country's constitution so women can vote in her developing country. So let's hear a little bit about her. One of your program officers has been talking to a few folks and has found out that this woman has housed outlaws in her home. She's sick and often bedridden, and she is a stay-at-home mom who has never had a full-time job and has eight children. <laughs> what would you think of Executive Director C for your $50,000 investment? Let's take a moment and review Executive Director A and human trafficking. Executive Director B, create international health care policy and a form of school for nurses. Or Executive Director C, amend our country's constitution so women can vote. And now you are going to vote. So take a moment and think about which of those three women you, being the foundation president, would invest in. And then we're going to hear how Ashley voted for these three hypothetical people. Cool. So it looks like votes are in. And 100%. So all of you guys voted for Executive Director C, um, which is really interesting. Wow. Yeah, when I when I first saw this, I thought of um, Executive Director B, but I feel like really there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and the first thing that kind of popped into my mind was um, our approach at uh, YFYI when we come across a project that doesn't seem very strong on paper. And so um, we know that most of our applicants have never written like a grant proposal, and then a lot of them come 
from different backgrounds. Um, so to cater to that need, we kind of created like a specific workshop um, to for our prospective grantees um, to become familiar with our requirements and to kind of learn about our process um, to make them feel like empowered and confident. So for example, if a grantee had like a really good idea, but it lacked overall development, we would encourage the youth leaders to like schedule a one-on-one -on -one brainstorming session um, to make the proposal stronger. Um, so the like the one-on-one -on -one approach um, kind of helps us identify the strengths and the areas of um, improvement in a project um, and the individuals in it. So it's not just I feel like about funding cool projects or really strong projects. It's kind of like investing in in the most valuable resource, which is people. Um, so I think that's kind of what makes it an art. Great, and I love that, investing in people. So mm -hmm. thank you for those insights and that one-on-one -on -one time too. So that is actually the perfect transition. So each of you voted and you all voted for executive director C as opposed to a radical immigrant or um, someone who's illiterate and wanted by the law. Um, but now, what would happen if I told you something a little bit more about each of them, if it would change your vote? So what if I told you Executive Director A was actually someone you know? She's Harriet Tubman and responsible for the Underground Railroad, a key abolitionist who helped make sure that slavery ended in the United States. And what if I told you Executive Director B was actually Florence Nightingale, who inspired the Red Cross, arguably the first modern nonprofit organization ever in the history of the world, and one of, if not the largest today, that helped countless people from blood transfusion to um, uh, helping solve problems in the wake of natural disasters and is incredibly trusted supported by foundations across the globe. And can anyone guess who Executive Director C might be? You actually all voted <laughs> for Lucretia Mott, who was a critical suffragette, along with um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, and others, who made sure that women could vote in the United States. And each of the developing countries I mentioned were the United States, because at one point, they were developing. Um, and uh, although we are a developed nation now, in many ways, we are still developing. So I hope you took a moment to really think about that, um, those big reveals, maybe some of you guessed it. But here's a couple of questions for you that are some of those uh, Mary Jones um, uncomfortable questions. What would happen if foundations only looked at grant applications? Would we miss some leaders like this? who, like Ashley was saying, might not fill out the best form, but might have the best ideas, the best mind, but doesn't know the jargon of philanthropy. Um, and also thinking on the more meta level, what would our world look like today without one of these women? Not only what would happen if the Red Cross wasn't there, but what would happen um, beyond that? Um, what would happen if your foundation funded one of these women with your seed money? And is your philanthropy right now creating fertile ground for the next leader who might be viewed as a radical today, but through the lens of history as a visionary? So I'll just leave a little bit of time for questions and then we'll wrap up. So, um, so we can do a few questions have come in, I'm seeing. Um, And we probably have about five minutes total. Um, so let's see about some of these questions that are in. And what I'll do first is just pivot to some of our youth leaders to see if they have ideas. But we have one question coming in, which is, um, you mentioned that helping form, or that helping nonprofits forming relationships and listening with nonprofit grantees were all examples of philanthropy as an art. Do any of you have more examples of philanthropy as an art? 
So any of the youth leaders want to jump in, or maybe I'll volunteer some of you <laughs> to jump in, um, of listing examples of philanthropy as an art beyond helping learning relationships and listening. Ashley, might you have an example? Yes. Um, so an example um, that I can think of is, um, for example, like when a grantee applies and they get rejected for, you know, for whatever reason, whether there wasn't enough civic engagement or um, targeting enough beneficiaries or, or whatever the, the case is, um, forming a relationship with a grantee to help them um, kind of build a stronger project, I feel like is an art. Like um, establishing a good relationship with your grantees, or not even if, even if they're not your grantees, um, is is what's special. And then helping them um, become a stronger project, I feel like is an art. So you're like making a good um, relationship, um, long term relationships, and then. Um, you start kind of forming friendships within the community. So I think that's that's um, a form of art. Right. And uh, we have another question here of um, Christine, does Alliance for Justice have any materials or best practices for how foundations can better work with nonprofits? Um, so Alliance for Justice, we are, um, as I mentioned, we have the attorneys to talk about philanthropic advocacy rules. We have um, our evaluation um, staff member who is trying to help measure it so that more science part, but some art. And then I'm working directly with foundations to help expand and explore the question of how can foundations be advocates and champions for their causes. And part of that is developing content and resources as well as events and uh, opportunities to underscore from each other. And um, there's one publication, actually two publications I recommend. One is called Words to Give By, and it's on Alliance for Justice's website. If you search Words to Give By instead of Live By, and it profiles about 20 foundation CEOs, um, and it explains how they approach their advocacy work in philanthropy as well as philanthropy in general, what motivates them, and it's more interview style. And then the other publication I'd recommend is coming out this summer, so please look for it, and it's called the Funding Change Playbook, and it's meant to be a fun coach's playbook that goes through 11 conversation starters on um, important aspects of philanthropic advocacy and championing work. And the very last chapter is, um, is I believe, 10 best practices of nonprofit leaders I'm sorry, 10 best practices that nonprofit leaders appreciate from their foundation. So we ask nonprofits, what do you like most about the foundation who work with you really well? And they were able to give us feedback. So that helps with some of the activities that we talked about. Um, so um, are there any other questions coming in? Or are there any other final thoughts from Jared, Jillian, Danielle, or Ashley? I think we're coming close on time. Do we have time for one more? Because we just passed our hour mark where we could wrap up. Not sure. All right, so I think we'll wrap up now. But if you have additional questions, you can reach me at Christine, B-H-R-I-S, -E at ASJ.org. I'll also be in Williamsburg with the NCSP conference that's co hosted with the Southeastern Council on Foundations and Philanthropy Southwest. And Youth Philanthropy Connect has just a myriad of opportunities this summer with all the great uh, connection conferences that they're hosting. So I'll just allow for. Um, this information here for you to think about. Um, also, the national conference, the national forum that is on family philanthropy in Seattle, October 14th to 16th. So think about you and your families registering now for that. And here's some information about additional webinars. 
that will be coming up on April 26th and May 11th. So meeting your peers and thinking about your voice and your world and building your capacity for change. And finally, here are these dates of the five different conferences that we just touched on convening. So Houston, Williamsburg, New York City, Indianapolis, and Seattle. So Catherine, Scott, and uh, her team does not rest. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you for joining For Youth by Youth, the art, of, the art and science of philanthropy. And I hope you saw that the basic moral of the story is that it's all art and science. Um, and there's so much that we can do in this laboratory of philanthropy. And that we're not just in the business of giving away grants, but of truly creating a better society and more equity. And that that's the most interesting conversation. Thank you for your time tonight, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in philanthropy. Any other questions?